I want to jump right into the scripture from Colossians chapter 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. And you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. I'm not naive, but I am polite. <clears throat> We've just heard six words that are multi-billion dollar industries and that have decimated countries, families, lives, churches. We have terms like human trafficking, which is such a nice way of saying women and children enslaved for the gratification of others who can afford to pay for them. We are not naive about these things, uh, but we're polite. And the Apostle Paul didn't write about global things. He wrote to a congregation and its people who were challenged by these same six words, just as we are challenged by them. And some of us uh, have been broken by some of these words. Some of us have lost our families, uh, lost our husbands or wives. Some of us uh, have nightmares because of some of these things or are imprisoned by them even now. So we are not naive. But we'll be polite in a sermon. I, I have three points and pictures and next steps and all of that stuff. But let's remember that <clears throat> there is real gravitas, real depth to the weight of these words on our society and on our lives. So why are we talking about it? Uh, did we just, <laughs> it, it was not because I thought, hey, we haven't talked about sexual immorality for a while. Let's, let's do that. Uh, we're looking at Colossians chapter 3, uh, and this is a text that is training material. Uh, it's workshop material for becoming real followers of Jesus. And I, I was in a class with other pastors and missionaries listening to uh, my mentor, Dallas Willard, when he was teaching this, and our jaws dropped, and we said, why else is anything else being taught? in church until we learn this, this powerful message. And he said, we need to look at Colossians chapter 3. And, uh, and so we did, and he encouraged us even to memorize it. And I'm encouraging you to memorize it as well. Um, we handed these bookmarks out last week. They are out at the hub, and you can pick them up. It has the entire text uh, and in about like two-point type, so you're going to have to really look at it close. But um, uh, pick that up, work on it together. Um, and <coughs> we look at a text that will help us genuinely become followers of Jesus. So uh, anybody uh, ever hear of the book, uh, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? Of course. Uh, so finish this sentence. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to want a glass of milk. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's a progression. It starts out little, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and worse and worse and worse. And then the mouse is going to want everything. And uh, so <clears throat> our six words is a progression as well. There are a lot of progressions we have in our lives. Uh, lots of things work that way. And uh, it's one, and we're going to work on it and what we want to do is learn to be with Christ so we can begin to resemble Christ, so we can begin to love like Christ. That's, that's the gospel, to be with Christ, to resemble Christ, to love like Christ. Uh, and 
Dallas wrote this um, because he said, we've separated the gospel from that message of becoming like Christ. He said this, the idea of having faith in Jesus has come to be totally isolated from being his apprentice and learning how to do what he said. If you think about that for a minute, he's absolutely right. It, especially in the United States where we have sound bites, little bits of words that we are able to tweet out. We say, well, what's it mean to be a Christian? What it means to be accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Wow, that, that rolls off the lips. But what he says is that that has become completely isolated from the idea that we become apprentices learning to do what Jesus did. That's what we're called to, to, to become people who live like him because he had the best possible life, one completely in relationship with his heavenly father, completely filled with the Holy Spirit. He says that's what you want. He didn't go on to say, but I think it's true, <clears throat> if you want a little bit of both, that's, that's a bad life. That's hard and ultimately miserable. So, um, we've read it, uh, and uh, these six words, and he says, put, put it to death. And so what comes to mind when I read this, number one, is stop watering the weeds. Stop watering the weeds. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So these are not weeds, uh, the plants that are up here. Uh, but we know that's what they look like when you stop watering, right? I, I don't know if you've done that. I could have taken this picture in my own backyard. This is, this is what it looks like uh, when you don't water. Um, uh, they die. Put to death. Stop watering the weeds. It means stop putting energy into them. Stop investing in them. Stop uh, paying attention to them. So I, I'll use dieting as, uh, as a... It seems to have a, for me, it resonates with some of this stuff. And so uh, anyone serious about dieting is going to take all the cookies, all the ice cream, all the sweets, all of that stuff, and, and really, serious people, all the bread, <laughs> all the carbs, and, and throw it away and get it out of the house. Put it to death. Uh, that's not what I do. What, what I do, and probably some of you, <coughs> you know, we want to be good stewards of what God has given us. So we'll eat, <laughs> right, all the stuff we have, but we're not going to replace it quickly. So, <coughs> right? Uh, but, but we should, but if we, if we really wanted to do it, we would, we would get rid of it. it. Put it to death. Don't tease yourself with these things. So these six words... Uh, are a progression. Um, feed one, and it leads to the next. Feed the next, and it leads on. Stop watering one, and the rest begin to dry out. It is different than the mouse and the cookie idea, because what most progressions we imagine, they start little, and they grow big. Paul has reversed it. He started with the worst, and then backed his way up to the beginning. That's why it starts with sexual immorality. And then impurity, lust. And if you read it that way, you go, I wonder what, the, what do all these have in common? They seem familiar. It's a reverse progression. So we're going to start at the top at, with idolatry. So here's what idolatry is. It's looking to an inappropriate source to satisfy our needs. So uh, back in the day, it was, uh, you know, big statues. Um, but today, it's lots of things. There's a lot of things that are idols in our lives. These are things that, are, that we look to to satisfy our needs. Uh, I'm sure your imagination can come up with some things just like mine. Um, but they are inappropriate sources for it, for happiness or satisfaction or uh, love, any number of things. And idolatry, which is an inappropriate source to satisfy our needs, leads to greed. Greed is wanting what others have in order to satisfy our needs. Do you see the, adultery, uh, the uh, idolatry built into it? The idolatry is looking to something to meet our needs. Greed is looking to something someone else has. We want that to meet our needs. And you move on then to evil desires. 
They are greed. It's greed for bad things to meet our need. Uh, so, for instance, <coughs> I, could be, I could have greed for your lawnmower. I mean, my gosh, have you seen the lawnmower? It's a riding lawnmower, and it's got digital, and oh my gosh, you can even, it probably run itself. I wish I had that. That's greed for something to, for, that you have to meet my need. It moves, it, it progresses to evil desires, which is, I want something else you've got, and I'm not even going to tell you what it is, because it's bad, but I want it. That's now, now greed has moved to evil desire. Evil desire moves to lust. And lust is greed for specifically sexual desires to satisfy our wants and needs. So you see how it's narrowing. The, we have this thing called idolatry, and it gets worse, and it gets worse, and now it's lust I specifically want, and it has to do with sexual. And then impurity is acting out on the lust. Lust so far is just in our heads. Impurity is doing things about it which leads ultimately to sexual immorality, which is acting out those impure things with another person. See, it's a progression. He starts with the worst. He says, get rid of that. And we go, no problem, I don't do that. <coughs> and, uh, and impurity. Oh, well, not that often. <coughs> Lust, <sighs> right? It works all the way up to, it's all, we're all here. We're all in this somewhere. We're all in it together. And he simply tells us, put it to death. Don't negotiate. Don't play nice. Uh, I will give you an example from my own life. I think I've shared it, of the progression. So I will occasionally get lottery tickets. I've got a couple friends I get them with. Um, when it gets up to a lot, uh, a lot, a lot, like, you know, hundreds of millions. And, and uh, I have figured this out, that basically with three people, Splitting a lottery after taxes, and if you to get it in a lump sum, blah, 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 it's, I get 10%. I'm going to get a check for 10% of whatever the number is. So it got up to 300 million, which is a lot. I don't know if you know that. That's a lot. <laughs> and we went and bought our ticket together. Uh, and, I, and I hold the tickets. And then I went back and bought one for myself. And I said to them as we walked back to our cars, okay, look. This one's ours, together. I'm going to take a picture of it. This one's mine. Uh, because, I mean, why not? It's 300 million. A and that would be a lot. <coughs> and one of my friends, thank God, he looked at me and he said, why? Is 30 million not enough? And I knew I had a problem when inside I said, not if I can have 300. And I went, now that's an idol, <laughs> right? A and, I, and, and I wanted, it, I had an I idol. The, the lottery could meet my needs. And then it became greed. I want your portion of it too. I'm buying it for me. And, and then I, 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 I hardly want to even go down the step to evil desires. Because we would sit around and sometimes with coffee in our hand, we would say, well, what are you going to do with your 30 million? Oh, these are such religious people. My gosh, we, I have this mission that I love in Africa, and I would fund it for, you know, 10 years. And I'm like, I'm going to get some more coffee, because <laughs> that is not the first thing that came to my mind that I'm going to do with this. <clears throat> so let's not go on any further. We, we need to move on. But I would say this. You can see the progression, right? It, it, it gets worse. It gets worse. Um, and and we, I hope that you can see it. So what's so bad about having a little greed, a little evil thoughts? I mean, it's just in our head. We're not acting it out, right? But it always gets worse. They always grow into something worse, something different. When we water greed, it becomes lust. And then grows into impurity and ultimately sexual immorality. If we put to death idolatry... The greed and the lust and everything else, it begins to dry up. It's so much easier to let go of it if we, if we put to death up higher. So here you go, next step. Turn off the source of temptation for one negative area in your life. Turn off the source of temptation for one negative area in your life and ask the Holy Spirit to remind you 
of your positive intentions when you are tempted. I don't know what the temptation is for you, but you do. And, and we play with it, and we, we, we allow it to tempt us. Put it to death. Just get rid of one negative thing and ask the Holy Spirit to give you a positive intention in place of it. Let God work with you. The, he wants to. So, um, but why? I mean, how bad is it really? Okay, I get it. Sexual immorality, that's bad. <clears throat> but the rest, is it so bad? I mean, is there, isn't it a victimless crime? You know, we can, uh, believe me, we can convince ourselves of a lot. Uh, and so, uh, just for the lucky among, the, among us who haven't had your stuff really hurt you, or the uh, naive who think it's all going to be okay, uh, or for the inexperienced who it just hasn't gotten caught up to you yet, let me tell you what Scripture says. Number two, the weight of God is coming. The weight of God is coming. Now, I have the text here. I, I didn't mess it up. I didn't mix it up. Because of these, these six things, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God. Now, when we think of the wrath of God, we think of, you know, fire coming down and, you know, or what, something. But the thing about the wrath of God is it, does, it takes a long time for it to show up. And, we never, and, then, and then if like if something shows up, is that the wrath of God? You know, did, I, did, this, did, I, did this happen because I sinned? Because I thought that one thought, then I got cancer or somebody else broke a leg? Ah, I mean, that's, that's magic. That's not scripture. That's, we're playing with the wrong game. No, the wrath of God, it, it's coming. It, at some point, scripture says that there will be a judgment that God will separate us uh, and she, like sheep and goats. There's all kinds. Some of the text, Scripture gets very explicit about what this is going to look like. But here's the thing about us as human beings. If it's more than a week from now, we're like, nah, not that bad. You know, I, I mean, none of us who are, you know, feeling greedy, you know, or something, and we want to steal something, they never, we never think, oh, wait, wait. I remember in Sunday school, the wrath of God is coming. Well, I'm not doing it then. No, right? I mean, future challenges aren't that big a thing for us. And I have proof. How many of you have enough money in your 401K? No, because we start, oh, good, one, yes, thank you. <coughs> you should be preaching this. So, because... We don't, we don't save enough for the future because it's the future. We'll let the future handle itself. So instead, I say, the weight of God is coming. Be and we know what that means when it's donuts, right? There are natural consequences to the actions we take. And we say that there are laws of nature and that there are laws of God. But if, if God created nature, then aren't the laws of nature laws of God too? And it's the law of natural consequences. Each one of these things has a natural consequence for our lives. Some of them is just isolation and separation and numbing of our emotions and dulling us down so we can't genuinely interact with other people the way we would like or they would like. You can move on from there. The tremendous natural consequences. Um, and these six words uh, have natural consequences. The thing about them also is, these six words are the way the world lives. You can bank on it. Greed. I mean, so much of what's going on in our world today, at the, at the national level, at the political level, at the international level, at the local level, is because of those multi-billion dollar industries and because of what the money people can make and the power people can have around the, the drives and desires of human beings. <clears throat> we need to ask ourselves a question. Who will I identify with? With the world or with Jesus? W eventually, we have to make a, a choice. The, the invitation is to not live in both worlds, but to move from one to the other. Uh, the, this Colossians begins with, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Remember? 
We have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Uh, there's plenty about it. So next step, list the natural consequences of having that negative area in your life. And ask the Holy Spirit to help you want to substitute a positive area in your life. What are the natural consequences of having this negative area in your life? Um, if you can't think of any, ask someone else. They've probably experienced it. Um, we, we, there are natural consequences to each one of these six things. And we've seen it, Lord knows we've seen it in the lives of friends, maybe in our own lives. I mean, it's the loss of jobs, the loss of spouses, the, lo the loss of so much. Um, the natural consequence of just uh, almost every single one of these just begins with the loss of. It's a loss. doesn't ever give you anything. There's the old way of life and the new way of life. We often want both, but the third thing is it's one or the other. It's one or the other. So the text says, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. <clears throat> um, are we sure? Can we have a little of both? Uh, we'll get to that. There are some things, you, you know, there are there, some things you can do in moderation and get away with it. Dieting comes to mind. Um, uh, re results vary, right? But, <coughs> but when it comes to one thing or the other, the results are in. Alcoholics Anonymous has been doing a, um, an unintentional social experiment for more than 80 years. They've had more than 2 million participants. And... Alcoholics Anonymous has, has given us the conclusion, alcoholics drink or don't drink, but they don't do both, right? That's what I'm so grateful to know and proud to know, alcoholics who have given it up, and they say, I haven't had a drink for uh, and so long, and I've been to parties where we're having a beer or a glass of wine, and we offer, and somebody says, uh, no, I don't drink. Uh, I'm not drinking. And sometimes they say, I'm not drinking today. And sometimes they say, I'm an alcoholic, I can't drink. But, but Alcoholics is, Anonymous has learned, you can, you can do one or the other, but not both. Um, it's like the person, you know, that old, that old thing, the person with, you know, one foot in a boat and one foot on the shore. It works as long as the boat's not moving, right? But eventually it starts to pull away, and then you've got to choose one or the other. And I say there's some things we can do in moderation. Uh, and some of you are better at this with dieting than I. Some of us can decide to eat a little less. You know what? I'm just going to... Uh, my brother-in-law, he has lost so much weight. Um, by He was taught, uh, fill your plate and then uh, leave a third of it or a half of it or something like that on the plate. And then you'll lose weight. I'm like, that would work? He said, well, try it. I said, I... I can't. I, I would eat. I eat it all. I, I will never know if that works or not. But he's lost all this weight. That's, that's dieting partially. Um, not for me. I find moderation difficult. I can eat light and lean, uh, and I get rid of everything. Um, and uh, almost as few carbs as possible. Um, it's, it's, it's turkey, you know, with no bread uh, for a sandwich. And or it's cinnamon rolls. It's one or the other. <laughs> I, I, I'm not that good. <clears throat> um, but the thing is, is that even eating is a progression. So I don't know about you, but when I'm eating poorly, I'm usually doing it on a couch. Because, right, if you're not eating, if I don't eat well, then I, I don't exercise. And, you know, I think it'll be tomorrow, uh, you know, or I, I don't know. I can lie to myself in all sorts of ways. But uh, if I am eating well... I'm getting to the gym because, doggone, I'm not going to put up with not eating cinnamon rolls just to not lose any weight because I'm not exercising, so I'm going to exercise. And if I exercise, you know, <coughs> they ought to take that one, I might tape over it, that one thing on the, on the machine that tells you how, much, how many calories you're burning. Because seriously, 100, 100, that's what I burned? I can eat 400 calories in a muffin, uh, you know, it's... What? Okay, so anyway, sorry, that's just about me. But, <clears throat> but right, but if I, if I burn those hundred, 
I am not eating that muffin because doggone it, those hundred are going to count, right? It's a progression, and there are positive progressions. Paul wrestled with this, with earthly things, um, these things that are not part of our new life. Last week's verse said we died with Christ. We are hidden with Christ in God. Paul wrestled with this. He's the one who wrote this. He would... I'm up here processing out loud, but he, he's doing it to every church he writes to. In Romans, he writes this uh, to, the, to the Christians in Rome. I know I'm rotten through and through so far as my old sinful nature is concerned. No matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do right. I want to, but I can't. When I want to do good, I don't. And when I try not to do wrong, I do it anyway. Now, if I am doing what I don't want to, it is plain where the trouble is. Sin still has its evil grasp on me. It seems to be a fact of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned, but there's something else deep within me in my lower nature that is at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is within me. In my mind, I want to be God's willing servant. But instead, I find myself still enslaved to sin. Amen? I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah, that's us. And, and he was brave enough to write it down. Um, this life is not like a little bit of dieting. Uh, we stand at the beginning and we progress in one direction or another. Um, we may... Uh, we may think that, well, I can do a little bit of this or a little bit of that, but we end up going around in circles. And I know you've experienced it like I have. And we're right back where we started from. But I want to tell you, it's not all bad news. There are some positive progressions. There are some things that if we will pour energy into them, will drive us and lead us in new positive directions. Um, And like the mouse with the cookie, it's a good thing. Uh, My daughter, Annie, Uh, has had a progression in her life. And these are natural progressions. Encourage our kids with this. In in high school, she wrote most of a story. I mean, it was like thousands of words. Um, But she got about 75% through, and then she went back and started editing it. She she wanted to, you know, she, she cleaned it up. She improved it. She wanted to have it perfect. She never finished writing it. She loved editing it. She must have had seven different versions, all much better, none of them finished, because she loved the editing process. So um, uh, in her, uh, when she went to uh, college, she got involved in the learning commons, which is you know out of the library, and, and students help other students. She loved it. She would sit uh, and uh, have somebody bring them a paper, and she would go through it and redline it and help them and say, here, here's all the things you need to change. Here's how you can change it. I would recommend this. You could go look at that. And she, it gave her life to do that. And so in her senior year, she went and got an internship in New York City with a publishing company. And she loved it. She was an intern editor. So when she graduated from college, she didn't move home. She moved to New York to get a job. Uh, to, to find a job in publishing. And she got one, and she was a junior uh, editor, and she moved up, and um, it, it was this wonderful progression, and she loves editing. She, she does it. She still is editing today. Uh, and it's easy to see that kind of progression. Let's put those progressions into our lives. Let's put to death. Let's stop watering the weeds and choose the life that God has for us. So here's the next picture. Uh, A next step, picture and write down what one day would look like without that negative area in your life. What would a a day look like without that negative area in your life? And ask the Holy Spirit to help you live that day. Now, this is very practical stuff. These three next steps, these are for you when you are ready to move in a new direction. When you are ready to let go, these work. And they all have the Holy Spirit involved because we all need God. But God is so willing and ready to help us. So here we are. We've made it to the end of a polite sermon with three points, three next steps, about six words that we all 
wrestle with, that some of us may still be imprisoned by, that some of us may have nightmares because of, or lost our jobs. Six words that have brought down leaders and pastors and churches that have destroyed marriages. We are polite, but we are not naive. Friends, let's put it all to death. 